clear all our doubts. So the great teacher is here, clear all our doubts. Because of the uh, situation of the students and so forth, when the teacher goes to some other realm, meaning that when he passes away, then I can't ask these questions. Particularly at this age of degeneration, Hindi mein hum log na kali yuga. Age of degeneration, degeneration of sentient beings, reflective emotions, time. Because of this, sentient beings are also very unruly. So to this unruly sentient beings, even if you give profound teachings, either they will not listen. They think there are many other better ways of spending life rather than sitting there and listening to a teacher. Better go around, make money, have fun. This is what people think. So people don't pay attention to these things. And uh, they also don't practice these profound instructions. By this, they may accumulate negative deeds even with the teacher. At that time, even those who are training in religious practices, who follow me, they may also get difficulty. So therefore, right now, when Atisha is here, I will request him to give a teaching which we, we can all follow and which we all can trust. Now, in order to do that, the real capacity is there with the Lama. So therefore, the capacity is there with all these great Lamas who have these blessings. So therefore, Dr. felt that I would request Atisha to tell us the names of his blessed masters. And therefore, he says, Atisha, you are the deity, supreme deity among the deities. And you are an incomparable teacher. You are the only protector of the sentient beings. You omniscient one, please listen to me. Today, when you, the victorious one, is living, give us this key to long-term happiness and peace. When you are here with us, among us, the fortunate ones, if I don't clear my doubts, due to the nature of sentient beings or followers. If you, the Dharma king, if you go to the next realm, then at the time of degeneration, it's difficult to ask such questions. This is what we I already read. So this is the request that he makes under this title, homage to the Lamas. Presence of the teaching, a teaching which is beneficial, that will come from the Lama. By counting his name, repeating his name, obscurations in our mind will be eliminated. Therefore, it is good to talk about the names of the great Lamas. That's what Adisha said. It's good to talk about the names of the Lamas. Because all your transmissions came from the Lamas, came from the teachers. Agama, as we say in Hindi, all the Agamas, they came from the teachers. Either directly or indirectly. Just by listening to their teachings, we'll be satisfied. 
So therefore, I will show their features, their characteristics. And he says, in my own case, I had that great fortune of having 150 teachers. By saying that he, he invokes these 150 teachers by saying that, please bless me uninterruptedly. All these are uh, highly accomplished and learned scholars who are almost indivisible from the, 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 the Buddha himself. And by recounting their names, it proves that the teaching, the lineage that I have is also authentic. And therefore, all of you who are gathered here from today and for many lives to come, it's by staying at the feet of a great teacher that you should promote the two accumulations, accumulations of merit and accumulation of wisdom. And then finally, you actualize the ultimate state of Dhammakaya, the state of Buddhahood. I pay homage to the great compassion. May I actualize the form body, the Rupakaya of the Buddha. And then Dumdaba said, Thank you. My teacher, my lama, it's amazing that I'm able to hear all these great names of all these great teachers. So therefore, I will summarize this topic by saying, I pay homage to all the teachers, all lamas. So this, I'm, I've taken just some of the essential points, but the description is much more, actually. This, this finishes the first chapter, paying homage to the special object. <clears throat> paying homage to the special object is almost like this. Normally, when we are able to achieve something, we think it is because of my great intelligence, my efficiency. But that's actually wrong. But you should remember those people who helped you. Remember your parents, remember your teachers, right? And therefore, in Tibetan, we have a tradition when you are venturing out on a business or some important work, you go and see your parents, elders, and teachers, seek their advice, ask for their blessings, right? So, there is the process. Now, the next line is I pay homage to the deities of devotion. This chapter covers the instruction on selecting four deities. There are many deities. In India, how many deities? Kitna crore hai? Devda. Deva Devi kitna hai? 33 crores, huh? 33 crores. Yeah, in India, they talk about the, the male and female deities, gods or deities. 33 crores. Good question. Deity is a difficult word, you know. If you use the word God, it's something like God, you know. But but the actual meaning of the deity and God is something who is the creator. But we are not talking about that right now. Even if you call them God, we use small g, not big g. We are not talking about the creator God. Okay. So who are like uh, much more enlightened, not Buddha, but much more enlightened, who are object of refuge, object of homage, right? So they are all there in different forms to help sentient beings. So in India, as he said, that they, they believe in 33 crores, so I think enough for the whole world population. Uh, but in Tibet, we have a saying, in India, they pray for one deity and achieve 100 deities. Tibetans pray for 100 deities, don't achieve even one. The Tibetans are not very good practitioners, probably. But there's a saying like that, true or not true, I don't know. But anyway, 
you know, in any human activity, we need to seek support of those who are more powerful, more educated, more intelligent than us, right? So these deities are, as I already mentioned, spiritually much more enlightened, elevated, compassionate, bodhisattvas, things like that. So their portrait of success, we need to visualize and meditate on these deities also. Now, therefore, now the question is, how many of them you can handle, you know? Impossible, right? So this is, I think, a very good practical solution. When you talk about paying homage to the deities, it, this, this chapter is called Chapter of Instruction on Choosing Four Deities out of all this, only four. Now, why we need this? The text says, during this time of degeneration, there are many hindrances, obstructions. Whatever we do, there are some hindrances, there are recovered, but they are not recovered, and obstructions. And there are not many personal deities who can bestow you those accomplishments. And not only that, there are some who can actually take away your accomplishments. There is many wrathful deities we have. If you don't know how to relate to them, you can earn their wrath and create more problems also. And especially there are worldly spirits. I mean, nature has so many spirits, positive spirits, you know, negative spirits. Some of these negative spirits, if you appease them, propitiate them, they will control you. Therefore, there is one spirit which has become very malevolent in the Tibetan society in the history. So he sold this Dalai Lama to it, propitiating that deity, that spirit. These spirits are like human beings, you know. They can help you, that they, they can harm you. <laughs> and among human beings also so many different types. So therefore, again, the one thing that we need to remember is the most important thing is one's own sincerity and uh, purity in one's spiritual practice. That's the most important thing, not the deities. Although you see many deities here and everywhere. Right? But the most important thing is purity of your heart and purity of your spiritual practice. If you have there, these deities are supposed to be those who had vowed to volunteer before Buddha and other great beings to take care of you. Whether you talk to them or not talk to them. Bodhisattvas are there to help you, whether you call for their help or not call their help, right? That you have to understand very clearly. The reason in Buddhism we don't believe in a created God is that one has to do the practice, individual human beings. If we are to solve the problems of the world, we can solve it by our effort, by our work, not just praying to God, not just praying to Buddha. I'm not saying it's useless, but the real solution will come through our effort, personal self-responsibility. If we want to remove poverty on this globe, not by praying, but by working. There's the idea. So this being the idea, on the one hand, when you say that I'm a Buddhist, I don't believe in a creator God, when you have so many deities, and as if they, they are creating everything, that is wrong. So to begin with, you need to completely eliminate this wrong way of thinking. 
They are only there to assist you, to help you. They are not creator. And this, this spendings, they are there. I mean, actually, it's quite advanced, I think. You know, in modern, we give many teachings through painting. But in, in Tibetan society, this painting came so many years back. I think good, very advanced idea. But you should not, it is not necessary to, to think that there is one yellow god sitting there all the time like this. Or Rajbul Didi, you know, sitting there all the time. These are there for you to visualize and think about what they symbolize. For example, the compassionate looking Avalokiteshvara is embodiment of compassion, personified. It was easy, easier for you to visualize. But what you need to primarily is not the deity itself, but the meaning behind the compassion. That's important. That's very important. Otherwise, many people, they might get carried away, not doing their practice, but then also like propitiating a deity all the time, you know. That will not work. Okay. So, therefore, he says, at this time of the generation, there are many who interrupt, not many who give you wounds or accomplishments. But in fact, there are some who will even do away with your accomplishments. So, therefore, I need a good deity, reliable deity. And to this, Adisha answered by saying, the deities that I'm going to introduce or give you are number one Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni. Number two, Avalokiteshvara, the deity of compassion. Number three, Achala. Achala is a, a wrathful deity, a guardian deity. And number four, the female deity, Tara. Why these four are selected out of so many candidates? These four are selected because you know why you why you are relying on these deities. You want to obtain a secure place. You want to reach to a safety place of safety, place of happiness, a place of peace. Then there, there cannot be anything more than the three: the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, which is our object of refuge. You know the meaning of taking refuge? Object of object, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I take refuge to Buddha, I take refuge to Dharma, I take refuge to Sangha. Those of you know, not so familiar, I'll explain this a little bit. People might think, okay, there are three entrances. Let us explain it in this way. Three entrances. The gateway or entrance to become a Buddha. The gateway or entrance to become a Mahayana. The gateway entrance to become a tantric practitioner, to enter tantra, the three gateways. If you don't enter that gate, you're not there, right? Just as you don't, if you don't enter this door, you cannot be in the home. So the gateway to become a Buddhist is to take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is not just repeating, I take refuge to. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Buddha, Sharanam, Gachami, Dhamma, Sharanam, Gachami, Sangha, Sharanam, Gachami, not just that, repeating, not just reiterating, but wholeheartedly taking refuge in them. That itself is a, it's not easy. Because then the question arises, why should I take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha? Who are these three guys? Who is Buddha, who is Dharma, who is Sangha? But why three? Because, in a sense, if you have not just three but more, you feel more protected. Or, in a sense, if not three, only one, it's more easy to handle. So, why not less? Why not more? Only three. The reason is when you physically become sick, especially very sick, you need a doctor. Right? And you need, even if the physician or doctor is highly trained, 
but without medicine, things will not work. So, doctor is not enough, you need medicine. Because you are very sick, but ridden. Doctor is not enough, medicine is not enough. You need somebody to look after you. Nurse, your brother, your sister, whoever, somebody to look after you. Three, very important, right? When you're physically very sick. Similarly, we are today sick with mental afflictions, negative emotions. So just like the doctor, we need teacher, qualified teacher like Buddha, who can, who can tell you what is your problem, how, how can you get out of this problem. He will give you the instruction, he will give you the guidance. But if you don't practice the teaching, it will not help you. So therefore, the second is Dharma, which is like the medicine, right? Now, even if you have the Buddha, you have the Dharma, but if you are, say, alone in a place where nobody talks about Buddhism, nobody practices Buddhism, right? Then very difficult because of the environment, because of the situation, very difficult to practice. Now here it's easy because so many are talking about Buddhism, so many are practicing. That's what we call Sangha, you know, Sangha. Easier. So, which is like the nurse or the helper when you're physically sick. So, just like when, you need, when you're physically sick, you need a doctor, medicine, and nurse. Similarly, when you're mentally ill with the negative emotions, you need a physician like Buddha, medicine like Dharma, and nurse like Sangha. Just the reason. Here's the reason, okay. Okay, is that clear? If you have doubt, just ask questions, okay. Yeah. You understand Sangha? The sangha, Sangha means spiritual community. Practicing, people who are practicing, just like you, there are others who practice you, who come at you, who encourage you, okay. Okay, so that is the entrance to become a Buddhist. The second entrance, entrance to Mayana is cultivation of Bodhicitta. If you cultivate Bodhicitta, you become a Mayana, pianist. If you don't, you are not. Then the way to enter into the Tantra practice is initiation, Abhishek, empowerment, okay? These three, we call it three doors. So what we were discussing was for requesting to help us to reach that very peaceful, secure place, there cannot be anybody bigger than the three, the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Okay. Now, out of this, Buddha is supreme because he is the one who is giving the teaching. Now, among, when we talk about, among, when we talk about complete enlightened Buddhas, there are many Buddhas, countless Buddhas have happened in the past. But in this period, in this eon, one that is better than all the past 1,000 Buddhas is Shakyamuni Buddha, who is born in India. I, I jokingly sometimes tease my Indian friends by saying Buddha was not a Tibetan, but Indian. I tease my Indian friends by saying this because I'm telling them Look, he's in India, but we follow him more than what you are. So please follow this, what I want to say, you know. So Buddha Shakyamuni. So therefore, we will take him as one of our deity. Then, out of those other deities, the Bodhisattvas, who are not Buddhas, who have reached a very high level, the 10th spiritual ground, which is next to Buddha. There, there are many of those types. But the one who is very special for the Tibetans is Avalokiteshvara, the deity of compassion. It is said that Tibetans don't have to 
teach this mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. You know this mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. This is not taught to any Tibetans. They just speak it out. Clearly showing they have this very special connection with this deity of Lokiteshwara. Om Mani Padme Hum. You know the meaning Om Mani Padme Hum. You know the meaning. No. You want to know the meaning? <laughs> Om. This combination of three letters, A, O, Ma, which symbolizes two meanings. One, it symbolizes the body, my body, my speech, my mind. The second level of meaning is it symbolizes the exalted body, speech, and mind of the Buddha, completely enlightened Buddha. The word Om has two meanings. Body, speech, and mind of the Buddha, body, speech, and mind of our ordinary people. Now, when we engage in any, any Buddhist practice, our purpose is to purify my ordinary body, speech, and mind, and gradually transform it into the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. That means the purpose is myself to become the Buddha, right? That's the purpose of practice. That's your goal. So that's the meaning of Om. How would you do that? What is the process? What is the method? Mani Padme. So mani, mani is, is jewel, gems. Padma is Padma, lotus. An I mean, interesting thing here, you see. Padma, the word Padma. Now everybody thinks this is a Tibetan word. This is, of course, some Hindi word. When this word came into Tibet, and then Tibetan translators were thinking about how to translate this, then, then they made some rules about translating things. One of the rules was, I mean, this is interesting for you also, one of the rules for translation was, if you are translating a word right, of any object which is not there in your country, then don't translate it. Leave it as it is. So it is said in Tibet, Lotus, not there. Right? So what they did was let the word Lord Padma as it is, and initially they put one word before that. Metho Pema, flower lotus, flower Pema. Just to make sure that this Pema means flower. A kind of flower, flower, penma, flower, penma. Then gradually do away with this flower, penma, everybody will know. Now everybody knows, Om Mani Padme. So this whole, whole, whole mantra, Om Sanskrit, Mani Sanskrit, Padma Sanskrit, Om Sanskrit, they're all Sanskrit. So the way to become Buddha is Mani and Padma, Lotus and Wisdom. Lotus symbolizes method, compassion, bodhicitta, loving kindness, and so forth. Okay? Just as lotus born in the mud, but comes out without selling by the mud. Okay? Money. Uh, Sorry, sir, I'm I making a mistake. Uh, sorry, sir, I'm making a big mistake. <laughs> money, 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 money means jewel, gem, which symbolizes method. Okay. Then Padma symbolizes here wisdom. Okay. So, so the meaning is it is through the combination of practice of method and wisdom by, by which you can become Buddha. There's a very beautiful summary. I normally call it combination of head and heart. Head means wisdom, knowledge. On the one hand, you need knowledge, and on the other hand, you need this compassionate heart. These two must go together. So it is through this combination of good heart and brilliant mind that, that you can become enlightened. Not only enlightened, even in ordinary life, if you have this true, 
you will be very successful. We have been discussing this a little bit this morning also, combination of head and heart. And through this, Om Mani Padme Hum. Hum means become one, indivisible. Your ordinary body, speech, and mind will become one with the body, speech, and mind of the enlightened one, Om Mani Padme. Clear? Now you all know the meaning of the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. Clear? So this, this is a very good sum summary of how to do with this practice. The objective is to, to refine yourself, purify yourself, and gradually become better and better, then finally become Buddha. And the process is good heart, good knowledge. Okay. So therefore, our Lokiteshwara, the deity of compassion, is chosen as one deity. Then the third is the four, faultless female deity, Aryatara. Aryatara is a female deity who is without fault and full of positive qualities and who is really, you know, embodiment of wisdom and who is the one who will protect you from the eight fears. And then Atisha says, this is the yeah. deity of the Lama, who is Atisha, myself, and therefore it is your deity also. So respect this deity. So this is the third deity that is being chosen. Then as, a, as we discussed, that there are some spirits, malevolent forces, which, we, which when you propitiate more, Instead of helping you, they will harm you and they might take your life also. There are many stories like that. If you relate to a, I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, being a dictator, being a corrupt person or dictator, something like that. If you are entering into a, you know, criminal gang, if you go there and when you get entrapped there, there's no way you can come out. Will kill you. So, like that. Similarly, if you relate without understanding, if you relate to the wrong spirit, at the end, they will take your life. Okay. So, such 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 a kind of deity is extremely negative, and is worse than a worse than a ghost. Because the moment you start propitiating them, the moment they will take advantage of you. And gradually you will be led into negative state of existence. And he actually names some so-called deities here, Dolly, Becker. These are like male warning forces, no use. In the recent account, as I said, the description that his holiness put is again this spirit called Tolgyal, which has remained very controversial in the Tibetan society for over 300 years. And created a lot of, I mean, we have to be very careful because in the name of religion, if you take a wrong step, you can get into big problems. Because people, when it comes to religion, people have such a strong emotion and blind faith, you know. So right in the beginning, it's important to, to understand what you're doing properly. All right. But then there is, he says, there is a protector deity who always gives you a boon or accomplishment and who was born from the body of the Buddha. And he is none other than the Achala, Achala the un, un, unmoving God. So this is your deity, this is your Dharma protector. And this will help you achieve all your sublime activities. And until the space sky comes to an end, he will not fluctuate and he will protect my teaching. So this, this, these are called the four Adamba deities. Or in other words, four deities of Dumdamba. Dumdamba is the main person of the Atisha. So therefore, we call them four Kadamba deities.
some years back, I commissioned making the pictures of these four deities. So if you visit Nagari, we have a Tanga there. And if you are, uh, okay, I don't promise right now. I mean, you can make a copy of this lady if you're interested also. It's a small thing I commissioned because when I traveled with this old Mr. Dalai Lama to many of the Russian republics, there are three, four Buddhist republics. See, in all these areas, his holiness give the transmission and teaching on these four deities. So, recalling that, in the library, I requested somebody to do a thunder painting of these four deities. So it is there. So that is the meaning of paying homage to the deities of devotion. So this completes the second chapter, instruction on using the four deities. Next lines, discard all doubts, cherish persistent practice. Thoroughly relinquish sleep, lethargy, and laziness, and always strive and persevere. Yeah, I, I don't know what kind of translation you are reading. But this is my translation, which may not be so good. But anyway. Read the next lines, four lines. You understood what I'm reading? Discard all doubts, cherish presence in practice, thoroughly relinquish sleep, lethargy, and laziness, and always try and persevere. So let us discuss this. Then Atisha said, Atisha told Dontaba that you should not have many doubts in your mind. In order to remove these doubts, you should study the Pitapas, the three Pitapas taught by the Buddha. Because for your long-term peace and happiness, this is the best. Because if your mind is, you know, infested with the doubt and suspicion, it will be very difficult to actualize enlightenment. Therefore, practice with one-pointed mind. Therefore, give up all doubts and follow this immeasurable teachings of the Buddha. Fulfill your practice and undertake persistent practice. Cherish them. Doubt. In the initial stage, doubt is important. But what he's saying is, don't just remain there having doubt all the time, not clarifying the doubt, no. In the beginning, doubt is different from suspicion, okay? Here, here doubt means two-pointed mind, whether this is, not this is. So in the initial stage when we are studying, we develop three kinds of doubts. Doubt tending towards what is not fact, then equilibrium doubt. Then doubt tending towards what is fact. That's the process. For example, if I if I say this cup, this cup is if I'm not so sure this cup is permanent or impermanent, then I ask the question: is this cup permanent, impermanent? Maybe permanent. That is doubt tending towards what is not fact, what is not true. The doubt is there. Then again, you think, then you are not sure. Equilibrium doubt, meaning maybe permanent, maybe not permanent. Then again, you ask questions. Then, oh, maybe permanent, maybe not permanent. I think permanent. Doubt tending towards what is fact, right? Then gradually you make correct assumption. Then direct perception. So question, questioning is very important. If you question, you get answer. Have doubt, question, very important in the initial stage. So when he says, discard all doubts means that in the initial stage, you have all these kinds of doubts. 
So he's not saying that you, you don't have, you should have, you shouldn't have any doubt, you just follow everything blindly. He's not saying that. What he's saying is in the initial stage, you of course have doubt, but don't just keep on having this doubt all the time. You know, clarify the doubt and remove the doubt. Make it clear. Yes, this is right, this is correct. Then it will be very easy for you to proceed towards the path with light and light. Right? Otherwise, if you have doubt all the time, then it's like a person sitting at the crossroad. Meghloganja this way, temple this way, where you know, just sit there. So you need to know this is Meghloganja, this is temple, this is Tushita. When you remove the doubt, then you can very easily go to Tushita, easily go to temple, wherever you want. So that's the meaning. Discuss all doubts. So in the beginning, it's very important in Buddhism to be skeptical. There's another very important feature. The Buddha never said, follow my teaching, I'm completely enlightened, follow my teaching without any doubt, have this blind faith, have this blind devotion, he never said. Never said. There's a very unique thing, perhaps, in the Buddha's teaching. He, he said, oh, bhikshus and wise people, just as the goldsmith judges the gold by cutting, rubbing, putting under the fire, similarly, judge my teaching through threefold reasoning. And it's only after when you conclude through this examination that the teaching seems correct, then you follow. But don't follow me out of respect. He had this confidence to say that if you think through analysis, through experimentation, through questioning, if you think my teaching doesn't make sense, it is illogical, it is contradictory, you have every right to not follow it. You have every right to say no. Right? This, this is very, very important, especially in today's world. And especially when, when we live in a world of fundamentalism and fanaticism, it's important to know what you're doing. You see? The teacher should explain things properly. The students should understand, follow properly, so that you become a sensible, logical follower, practitioner, not a fanatic, not a fundamentalist. Because the Buddha gave this teaching, when the Buddha was giving teaching, he had already acknowledged that there are countless sentient beings with countless mental dispositions. No one religion, no one teaching can fulfill the need of all these people. Therefore, let them choose whatever they like. If you like Judaism, good. If you like Islam, good. If you like Christianity, good. If you like Buddhism, good. We never say, I don't, I hope most of the teachers are like that. But at least I follow His Holiness Vana. In His Holiness, never say Buddhism is best. Never say Buddhism is best. He never thinks Buddhism is best. Because this very question, which religion is best, His Holiness says, this very question, which religion is best, is a stupid question. A stupid question. It's like asking which medicine is best. When, when such a question is asked, which medicine is best? You cannot say, pick up one medicine and say, this is best because it's costly. For you, that particular medicine is best, which cures your particular illness. But this does not mean that this medicine is good for other person who is having a different illness. So for you, for me, Buddhism is best. For you, Judaism is best. For you, Hinduism is best. But that does not mean, mean to say that this is best for everybody. This is good for everybody. Because everybody has different need, different coming disposition. So with this understanding, we should respect all religions. Right? All religions. Don't fight over the philosophy of different religions. 
But look at the message of all these different religions. The message, the important message of all religions is brotherhood, sisterhood, compassion, right? Mental purity. This is not the only religion. But sometimes, unfortunately, even the individual followers, respected followers, they, they, they don't sincerely follow what is being taught, but fight over the empty philosophy, you know. There's a creator. Ah, oh, those who believe in creator is best. Don't you believe it? Don't those who don't believe is worse. Or those who don't believe this, oh, because we don't believe we are the best. Those who believe they are wrong. Stupid. Right? So this kind of more liberal attitude. And not only that, there are people who are against all religions. Is it their right? Is their right? Is it? But whether you believe in any religion or not, what is important is you should be a good person, compassionate person. This is important. That's the most important thing. So therefore, those of us who claim to be a follower of a particular religion, for us also, the first thing that we need to do is don't talk about complicated philosophies. Because first talk about this day-to-day -day needed qualities like love, compassion, harmony, emphasize on it. See the sameness of everybody. It's very, very important. Okay. So, discard all doubts. So, the process of removing all the doubts is study. Therefore, there's a lot of emphasis for study in Buddhism. Study, listen to the teaching, contemplate on the meaning of the teaching, meditate on the teaching. Clear all your doubts. And through that way, you will be able to really actualize the long term happiness and peace. And as he said here, if your mind is in, in, infested with the doubt, difficult to achieve enlightenment. Therefore, practice with one pointedness of mind. Practice with one pointedness of mind. Practice with concentration. Concentration is the source of success both in war and in peace. Concentration is not only in Buddhist practice, but everywhere concentration is important. Take the example of a laser beam. When the lights of the laser beam are scattered, it doesn't have the capacity to cut through steel. But when the lights of the laser beam are Focused, concentrated, it can cut through steel. I mean, this is again important, very important. Whatever you are doing, your regular studies, Buddhist practice, or any work that you are doing, concentrate on that work that you are doing. If you concentrate, you will enjoy. We don't. We, we, we normally don't enjoy much about whatever we are doing because we are not concentrating. Learn, learn, learn from a child, from the small children. Small children, you throw some broken toys. They will concentrate. They will play with it the whole day. The parents come and say, now it's time to eat. Still, they will, uh, let me play, mama, let me play, papa, you know. They are concentrated, they are enjoying. There's nothing, it's a broken toy. But they are concentrating, they're enjoying. So similarly, whatever what we do, if we enjoy, you can accomplish that work very easily. You will enjoy it and you will have not, not, no understanding how the time flies. Therefore, we have this very famous saying, one aeon is one minute, a month aeon is one moment, and one moment is one eon. One eon is one moment means those people whose, whose mind is suffering, who are not appreciating anything, who are not delighting anything, 
time is long, you know, very long. When you're sick, when you're suffering, when you're unhappy, time is very long. When you're enlightened, when you're Buddha, you have no sense of time. One eon is one minute, one moment. Then we, we all have some experience, you know, when you're really, when you, for example, when you're on a picnic or some other, you know, interesting things that you do, you have no sense of time. The time goes so quickly. So what I'm saying is delight, delight in whatever you do, especially the positive virtuous practices, good works that you do, you, you just delight. Say, I'm lucky I have this opportunity. Wonderful. Enjoy it. Just, just almost become a part of that object. That's how the artist is. They are able to create so many interesting things. You see? You almost go into that art. You make it almost alive. Because of concentration. And human concentration, if you are able to do that, you know, so many clairvoyants, even, be, be, even being able to fly, so many things are achieved. Of course, needs a lot of practice. Right? Human mind is just, just, just unbelievable, amazing thing, if you know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you need to remove all this down, study the three Peter class. And in order to achieve their purpose, cherish persistent practice. Cherish, that basically means delight. Delight in repeatedly doing it. Look at some of this famous world athletics, the gold winners. They delight in what they are doing. Physically very strenuous, very difficult, you know, but they're able to do it. Because the, their mind is after it, their mind is concentrating, their mind is delighting it. Right? So therefore, first thing that you need to do is, if it's important thing, something needs to be done, don't say, I cannot do it. Right from the beginning, don't say, without even trying, don't say, I am not, as we say, I am not a mathematic person. Don't say that. There is nobody who is a mathematic person right in the beginning. I am not a morning person. They keep on sleeping. No. <laughs> there is nobody who is a morning person. <laughs> you have to make yourself a morning person. So don't, don't discourage yourself by saying, I am not the person who can do this. I mean, if something you don't want to do, that's different. But you have the capacity, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should do everything. What I'm saying is you have the capacity to do many of those things. If you want to do, if it is important to do, then you have to do it, embrace it. Persistent practice. Nive Sejam is a Buddhism. There's a famous Tibetan teaching which says for one day, you get so interested in the spiritual practice that you even forget your food when you make effort. As soon as you start training and studying, you want to become a learned person, a scholar. And after three days, it is not based on your practice. You forget everything. You don't make effort. You discontinue your effort. Such a person will never get anything. Therefore, make effort just like a running water, running stream. When look at the running stream, they will never say that I will run only in the day and stop in the night. Have you seen the streams resting in the night, not running? <laughs> They'll keep on flowing. So we may not be able to run 24 hours, but that means continue day after day, continue your practice. And you will be. I mean, the interesting thing is, as Shanti Deva says in his Bodhi Charyavatara, there is nothing that does not become easy when you repeatedly practice it. Therefore, have patience. 
and through multifarious ways undertake persistent practice. That is his advice. Is it? You need to only pay some attention and make effort, and you, you can do it. And once you're able to do it, you will be so delighted. I did it. In many areas, in many fields, we don't teach it because we don't even start. And then you make very short-lived attempts. How can you do things like this? So, resistant practice. Especially when it comes to removing your negative emotions. You are very strongly habituated with negative emotions. Anger, jealousy, hatred, all these are there. Because we have this animal traces of animal. In the beginning, we were animals. We still have those traces of anger, invitation, jealousy. So we are habituated with that. We have this diehard habit. It will not go away so easily unless you make persistent practice with the opposite positive practices. Right? You know, he's holding this Dalai Lama, he was almost acknowledging that he has developed the Buddha. You know, before you were saying, it looks like if I make effort, I will be able to achieve it in this life. Yeah. Showing that he made big progress. Now, recently, he was almost acknowledging that he developed the Buddha. You see? So, whatever be the case, if we take our own example, you know, like for example, I, I believe most of you are like educated, you see. You've done you know, maybe BA or MA or, you know, so many things you've all done. Who did you do this? In the beginning, you don't even know ABCD. Who did you achieve this? That, that shows you can. Take an example of Einstein, one of the biggest brain in science. He never said, my brain is full, now I can't make any progress. He said, I am able to use only 5% of my brain, 5% five, five or something. And he said, if I'm able to, I don't even remember the exact number, but he said something like, I made 4 or 5% use of my brain, the rest I'm unable to use it. And if I'm able to use at least 11%, something like that, the exact number I don't remember. If, if I don't remember a certain number, number 11 or something, I can make miracles. That's what Einstein said. You see? So we are not using our brain at all. Almost at all. I'm not talking about the mental exercise. Even if you talk from the point of view of the science, the brain development, the good news, the good news, in accordance with Buddhist teaching, is according to the classical physics. They say when you grow older, your brain will become, you know, hardened. Then you will suffer from the old man's disease, you know, dementia. Nothing you can do. That's what they used to say. Now today, scientists are talking about neuroplasticity. If you train it, it becomes elastic and plastic. You know, it's just, they, they say it's like the road. You know? If you continuously train on the road, the road will be clear. You may have to do certain little bit of repair here and there, but it will be a good road. But if you never train on a particular place, it will be full of, you know, stones and leaves and things. You cannot go. So our mind, now according to science, they say if you don't use your brain, then the neural pathways get blocked. Communication becomes difficult. You see? So even from that point of view, it's important to, to study, to think, exercise the brain, you see. And in, in Buddhism, it says the very unique you know, quality of the mind is unlike the body. When you train the body, there is a limit beyond which you cannot go. Because just as I said this morning about the limitation of the physical material resources, similarly in the brain is also a physical thing. Right? So similarly, when you train your body, let us say in the 
in the Olympics. You train for many, many years. You, then you become the world number one in long term literacy. World number one in long term. Like big achievement. And on top of that, you do more jumping and more training. You may make some progress, right? But it will never come to that person that he will be able to, with, with training, with passage of time, it will never, you know, become for that person that he will be gradually able to jump from one mountain to another mountain. Is it possible? Because the basis on which you are giving the training is a physical. It is a limitation, just like boiling water. If you boil water, it becomes water, 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 100 degrees centigrade, boil, then what happens? It will not become water. It will change into vapor, disappear. It will not become water. Because this is physical. Now, unless those, unlike those physical objects, when you train your mind, the more you train the mind, the more mind, the more the mind becomes clearer, sharper, concentrated. You see, that's how you, there's no limit until you become completely enlightened, which of course takes a long, long, long time. And that's why I put the example of people like Einstein and others who never said, my brain is full, I can't train more. Right? But here, of course, when he says this, he's talking about brain, but he's confusing it with brain and mind. Right? Okay? So therefore, we should appreciate this special quality of the mind and undertake that persistent practice. You know, even for a sportsman, he has to, you know, do persistent practice. Now, in order to be able to do this persistent practice, you need to sacrifice few things. Huh? You need to give up laziness. Because if you, have, you, if you get used to lazy, being lazy, then that will create more doubt. Meaning that you will not study, and doubt will always be there. You will not make any progress. So now when we talk about laziness, laziness is of many types. One, as we normally understand, being lazy means not doing anything, just sitting there, lazy, lazy. But there are more. One is called laziness of having attachment to inferior things, to not so good things. When you are undertaking a good spiritual practice, instead of showing interest and making effort in it, if you show interest in some other things which is useless or inferior, there is also found with this laziness. For example, if you are to do a meditation today, then say, oh, no, not today, tomorrow. Today I have to go and watch a movie. That's laziness. That right? Then the third kind of laziness is Laziness of postponement, which is more or less I wanted to explain, but there are a lot of similarity. Laziness of postponement. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, tomorrow never comes. This is what we do. When it comes to eating the food, we never postpone. We never postpone. In in in, in a very busy countries like in the West, people are really busy, I know. But they manage to give something, you know. Cup of coffee, cup of tea, and then you know something. Yeah, 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 talking and going, you know, walking, you know. Right? I remember this very well when many, many years back, his oldness the Dalai Lama gave a teaching to you know, people from France in the temple. I was there, not his translator, but I was there. So during the question hour session, his uh, French women asked a question to His Holiness. Your Holiness, 
in the West, we are so busy, we don't get time to practice. So what should we do? Many soldiers said, it is up to you whether you want to be practicing or not. So initially I thought his oldest this is a little bit blunt. <laughs> but he was not blunt, he was true. Then he explained it by saying, nobody is forcing you to do practice. If you think this is important, this is something that must be done, you have to find time. You will find time. You have to find time, you will find time. Just as you are finding time for so many other things. So why not this one? You see, so when we say, you know, if I get time, then I'll practice, it means you're already not showing much interest in this one. You see, this is less important. You know, my my you know, work in the company, making money is much, much more important. You know, I'll do this. So there's, there's why one, one Buddhist teacher, he almost scolded the practice, the practitioners by saying that in this way, you're wasting your life. And he said, not being able to do Dharma practice, 20 years is the most. That's when we are young. Not being able to do Dharma practice, we miss 20 years. Then next 20 years, now until 40, 20 to 40, you will say, I'll do that operators, I'll do that operators, but not me. So you miss another 20 years, <laughs> but not, not being able to do the operator, but saying, I'll do, I'll do. Then 40 to 60, you are already not getting old. Then you regret and say, I could not do the operators, I could not do that. And he said, this is your empty biography. Right. So not only from the, 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 the devotional aspect, but in terms of our actual benefit in our actual life, a, a time and again, it is clearly shown that how you think makes such an important difference, impact in your life. It's repeatedly said in all religions. It is now repeatedly found in own science, you know. Now they are talking about self-compassion, emotional regulation. You know, everybody is not talking about it. Because they, the more they analyze, the more they are seeing it. Even in science, there was a time, at the time of Newton, they say, be objective. We scientists is objective. We talk about only what is there, nothing else. Now they are saying, you can never be objective. Because in you know, order to explain that object, you have to involve the subjective mind. When you involve your subjective mind, your subjective mind is already wearing different colored glasses. The different philosophies that you study, the environment in which you are living accordingly, you will manipulate and explain the object. So that is why scientists like Heisenberg, they said, uncertainty principle. Now, even in quantum physics, now they are not there saying, you know, nothing is definite. Right? So, therefore, what I'm saying is that the subjective role is very, the mental thinking is so important. And it is in your hand, it's not in the hand of anybody, it's in your hand. Let me give you an example, you know, because through these talks, I want to like say things that you might feel it's beneficial, you know. Let me give you an example, because we talk about importance of mind, importance of mind, importance of mind. People may think, yes, 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 yes. But in that legal life, they think, oh, not, not mind, money. Money is more important. That's how we think, how we live our life. So it's important to, to give clear examples of how mind makes impact, how mind is important. Let, let me give you an example of two people who are suffering from migraine headache. Migraine headache of same intensity. Two people. The migraine headache of same intensity, as far as the illness is concerned, exactly same. But their mental attitude is different. One, when he gets this migraine headache, this, this one person, let us say he is the one with positive ways of thinking. When he gets the migraine headache, of course he has this pain. So he would ask the right question by saying, why I am getting this migraine headache? 
Maybe I am tired. Maybe I am hungry. Maybe I need to go to hospital. You know, he, he thinks about all these things. Then if he is a Buddhist, he might say, oh, this is a big pain, but it's good, you know. All my negative karma that I did is getting purified. And if he's a believer in God, he might say, oh, this must be created by God. There must be some purpose. You see? Then when his friend comes, he, will, he is having a lot of headache, but still he will, he will try to smile. Come, come, come. I'm getting big headache. Now. But please come see it. And then they will say, oh, can I help you? Let us go to hospital. Can I make food for you? They'll help you. Guys. So because of this attitude, you get friends. You're able to do your prayers, you know. You will keep the doors and open, windows open. Fresh air is coming. And you can go, you know, peep through the window. You can see beautiful flowers around. You can see people, the children play cheerfully. These are all uplifting, you see. And that reduces the intensity of your pain. You are recovered much more quickly, much more quicker. This is not what I'm saying. Scientifically, they are saying this now. Now look at the other person who has a negative attitude. He gave this pain, he doesn't question, he will just go in the home, close the door, close the window, switch off the light, what does he see? Thumbs. Then if he's a Buddhist, well, he will start you know, saying bad things to the Buddha. He will say, Buddha is said to be compassionate. If he's compassionate, where is compassion? I'm dying with this headache. Believer in God, he would again say bad things again like God by saying, this something must be created, this dead love. You see? And if he friends come, smilingly, lovingly, he will say, how the hell you can smile and love when I'm, my head is cracking? So they will also go, he will, not, he will refuse to eat food, refuse to go to hospital to take medicine. Then the situation gets worse. That's what I'm saying. Your mind plays a huge role. Huge role. Sometimes when you are dealing with you know, not clear. Just even going for a walk in the nature just helps you. You have a bad take nap, nice nap. That's what they say. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go for a picnic. If you want happiness for a month, get married. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said it, I'm not saying it. <laughs> okay, so so what I was discussing was yeah, removing laziness, laziness of procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'm never doing it. So don't don't postpone your practice. Because life is short, as we already discussed. Whether they will be tomorrow or not, not sure. So do it now. Do it now. Okay. Then, th then fourth kind of laziness is laziness of uh, laziness of despising yourself, disparaging yourself, looking down upon yourself. Yeah, all this practice must be done, but, but how can I do this? I'm not intelligent. I have no time, you know. You, you just, just look down upon yourself. You discourage yourself. That's also laziness. So get rid of all these different types of lazinesses. Because if you remain lazy, you will not be able to clear those doubts. And in this way, you will miss this great purpose. Mm -hmm. What is important is not so much about how profound the teaching is, but how much you are able to practice it. So with this teaching, Dr. says, you have given many profound teachings. But through these teachings, I'm able to see all these teachings as of one test. So therefore, I'm now, now to this countless teachings, I'm 
selecting this three, the three Pitakas. Sutta Pitaka, Abhidharma Pitaka, Vinaya Pitaka. So these three sets of discourses, all the countless, normally we say 34,000 classes of Buddha's teaching. They are all summarized into the 12 sets of scriptures, which in turn included in the nine sets of scriptures, which in turn included in the three Vedas. Okay. So in this way, the Kadamba tradition primarily practices four edis and three teachings. What you do mean? Well, I think it's seven features of four deities and three scriptures. So in short, what this particular chapter is saying is get rid of all doubt and make persistent practice. And remove lethargy, laziness, and always strive and persevere. So this, this is basically all the same. So this completes the third chapter. Okay. Okay, I stop here. Ask some questions. Any question? Not necessarily related to this teaching, but any question. When I say ask any question, I'm not at all saying I have all the answers. But <laughs> if I have something to say, I will say. Otherwise, we can help each other. Okay? Yeah. Um, it's a question about huh? refuge. Yeah. So, like you said, people say they take refuge, but in their daily life, when difficulties come, they take refuge in entertainment or food. Or exactly. Like that. Exactly. Yeah. The definition of a Buddhist is someone who takes refuge, but would it be more likely to say that the definition of a Buddhist be someone who aspires to take refuge? No, no, whether you're able to do it or not is a different issue. What we are talking about is what it should be. Okay. Okay. The right thing is that you should be wholeheartedly taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Because if you make a half hearted attempt, you're not going to achieve anything. So, would you say one So, of course, in one way, we say try your best. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no other way, you know, try your best. Yeah. But the desired thing is that you should understand. And why you need to take refuge number one. That's the most important thing. Normally, we are unable to take wholehearted refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha because we don't see the suffering. We don't see the fear. That's why, that's why we say, first of all, meditate on impermanence, especially death. Yeah, I say, like, on one day you do take refuge, and then the next day you don't. And then it's like inconsistent. That's why we have just heard now, now we said cherish persistent practice. <laughs> you see? But it's just like, oh, maybe I'm going to do this today and not tomorrow. And then, then the next day I will be in the... Yeah, no, I, I have given you the, the, the example of the running river. You know, it should be like the running river. But if you are unable to do, I mean, it's understandable. We are not enlightened beings, but we should never get discouraged. You know, make it a you know, point that at least in the day you spend some time, devote some time for your practice. That's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you talk a lot about um like do, do not suffer, right? And there are a lot of cultures that the way to not suffer is to have a bigger meaning. Um and this meaning can be sometimes I don't know, good or bad, maybe they can cause harm, but eventually they can help you to end your own suffering. Um, are there meanings that are good or bad? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. good question. But what I'm saying, or what, what, what is being said in Buddhism is, what we are saying is, suffering is there, whether you accept it or not. Aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, birth is suffering. Right, and there are so many others. Not not meeting those people who who you want to meet is suffering. Meeting those who you don't want to meet is suffering. Seeking a job not finding is suffering. <laughs> I mean, there are so many countless problems and suffering that there. So what we are saying is, there are all these types of sufferings, and then there are 
other sapiens which we even don't notice the conditioned suffering as we say the very basis of all the sufferings that is there we don't understand this so what we are saying is number one acknowledge that these are there and acknowledge the fact that we don't want sufferings but since these sufferings are there you will have to you have to face them when you face them then you should see the sufferings as introduction to happiness as i said the other day see the sufferings as challenges don't run away from them just study see how you can face them how you can deal with them then you will gain new insight you know you can you can gain new experiences this is exactly what you are saying you see so when you when you encounter suffering when you encounter challenges you get new opportunities to understand your to your reality so the many scientists they also they also say close of us they also say the same thing you see they say that you know whatever be your situation don't think that you will be in that situation forever it may be a difficult situation but if you get up and go and do things you can you can learn so many things life the nature of life it shall be such that you will encounter all this ups and downs there's a learning experience right okay yeah so we were talking about the harmful beliefs yeah not we take ourselves uh, no i don't know because because you know here here i I'm, i'm i'm kind of translating what is there that we want now now so now how can you so best thing is just give it nah, whatever that means <laughs> because if i use god and deity then i say bad deity bad god i don't know how how it sounds but what we are actually saying here is there are powerful spirits basically what, what we are saying is there are powerful spirits some of them are really good spirits they can help you then there are powerful spirits yes. or really bad, nasty, they can they harm you. So this is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. When we meditate, we try to clear our mind and get, expose ourselves to like, the nature of conscience. Right? Yeah. Like, clear mind. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. So being enlightened, you know, the Buddha, yeah. is he like achieved Um, eternal clear mind or is it, is that just a tool for us who want to get enlightened to yeah this is just a tool it's just a tool so the goal is not clear to have always a clear mind but the, the, the goal is to not to have any of the negative emotions the goal is not to have any suffering the goal is not just empty your mind and say there no still you have suffering still you have ethical emotions right so the very purpose very 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 reason why you which is done primarily in joking like this where you just watch the mind the nature of the mind meaning that normally our mind chases chases the object our mind chases the object If it's a beautiful object you get obsessed there you chase it if there is an object which you don't like you chase it you try to drive that away your mind becomes extremely busy chasing all the objects and all these objects that that is there is actually mistaken so you are pursuing after almost like mirage you know mistaken object and you chase and chase and chase and then the end result is you get completely tired that's what we are experiencing today so many people are talking about depression low self esteem this is because you are chasing objects and so many things are coming you know not only the physical objects but also now what they call as artificial intelligence and then metaverse and then then what so many things are there we are already hallucinated you see we are not able to see the object as it is we are hallucinated on top of that the technological are also creating more hallucinations and we are just seeing that hallucination now you sit here with this in accordance with this explanation of the metaverse you can just sit here and buy a 
room in Porta Lepe in the same Pasa debate. For that, you have to pay. And you have hallucinated, you know, you pay. And you think you are staying in class. Like so, more and more, I mean, we can learn things from there also, just like the Buddhist teaching. I'm not saying this is completely wrong because my knowledge is very initial. I don't know much, but the little bit I heard is something like that. You see. So, the, the important thing is discover your identity. Forget about the multiparous objects and subjects, but discover your identity. Who are you? We know so many things about other things, you can go to this, that, you know. But the, the, the least thing that we know is about ourselves. <laughs> right? So it is by knowing oneself that one can ex extricate oneself from this illusion. So in that practice, what you what you try to do is don't let your mind remember the past. Don't let your mind think about the future. Just stay on what we call the rigpa, the pure kind of awareness, which is very difficult because we are so used to chasing object. You can't think about the mind without any object. But in other words, mind is not running off the object. So through repeated practice, when you are able to just observe the nature of the mind, then all the objects are coming, they are going there, you know, as, as usual. But now you don't chase the object. You don't chase the object. It's by chasing that we get this, you know, get tired. Hindi mein agar hum bolein, bagdor ki jindagi mein, you know, how much running you are going to do now? There is this story of Anguli Mala, at the time of Buddha, he was a murderer, killer, serial, serial killer. He, again, you see, that's why we say this morning we just discussed about finding the right teacher. He found a wrong teacher who said, you kill 1,000 people and do this human sacrifice, you will achieve such and such a spiritual height. So he kept on killing people. 999 people he already killed. Then on the morning when he was looking for the, the last person, Buddha knew that this is going to happen. So nobody was there. He couldn't find any person on that day. Then while walking a little bit, he saw Buddha. Buddha intentionally appeared before him. Buddha was walking slowly, peacefully walking before him. This Angulimala with his you know, ugly looking body with the sword, you know, sweaty body, you know, he's running. Hey, you there, you stop, who are you? Then Buddha stopped, looked back, smiled, and said, It's not me who is not stopping. It is you who is not stopping. So come, what have you to say? And <laughs> he was shocked, you know, he never met a person who is not terrified in his presence. Here, this, this person is just calm and smiling. Then they had, they had some, you know, conversation. Then he got completely changed through the sword, fell at his feet, and completely you know, changed. He became a good practitioner. That's what the story says. So sometimes, unfortunately, I think modern people are like Angulimala. We are running, 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 not reaching where we should reach. And in today's world, we, we all say, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. As if, as if to be busy is important. Is it important? Seriously, tell me, is it important? To be busy for me is not important. What is important is what are you busy about? This is me we are saying. What are you busy about? Stop many of this useless running. Take rest, be happy, do some creative works, do things that you really like to do. You don't just become a slave of the money. Of course, you need certain money. <laughs> for your good clothing, house, thing like that, apart from that. You see? So, I mean, there's so many things to talk about, you see. The modern, so many modern diseases, which human beings created, right? Okay, yeah.
how do we balance Geshe-la, some kind of engagement with the world that you've pointed out? You've got some pretty bad negative karma right now. And having the time, not having the time like, oh, I don't have time today, but having the real time with people who renounce everything, make tremendous spiritual progress in Buddhism. But if we're you know, also engaged in the world and trying to bring truth to those situations, does that take to the time away from our own practice? Are we sacrificing our own enlightenment or trying to do something, that, you know? Yeah, this is very important, but completely a question because it depends on the level of realization of that person. So, but there are many ways of doing it. One, as I briefly mentioned this morning, meditative session, post-meditative session, you know. So, if you're practicing, not only do your practice in seclusion, but also come out in among the people and help. It's really important. It's really important. And I've been telling this to many of my Tibetan friends that we need to not just talk what come out and want in the society. Show that we are, we have that willingness to do for people. If you don't do it, how can, how can other people know? How can you make an impact? There's an English saying, you judge yourself by what you think you can do, but other people judge you what you have done. You see? But it takes time, you know, for people to change. So gradually, gradually, people are picking up, people are learning, people are learning more tools to get more connected, connected to people, you know. And then in many cases, you need also huge amount of money to do many of these things, you know. It's, it's, not, it's a complicated situation, you know. And then when you get a lot of money, you might get crazy also, you see. So as you are right, this balancing act, this tight rope balancing act is a difficult act. But but we should really like not only equip ourselves with this knowledge and learning and experience, but more important things share it to other people. This so really should it be at the expense of our own progress though, if we take so much effort to put into an external no, it, it it depends, it depends, you know, it depends. Sometimes you learn more when you interact with other people, you see. For example, practice of patience, you know. If I meditate on patients, you know, see there, it's very comfortable, nobody is bothering me. My patient is perfect. But when somebody really comes and bothers me, <laughs> there is a story actually. There was a group of beings who are like venturing into the forest. And then they met one sadhu meditating there. Then this, the, the king and the emperor asked, what are you doing? He said, I'm meditating on patience. Mm -hmm. Then the king said, if you are meditating on patience, then eat my sheet. Yeah. Then, the, then, the, then the meditator also said, you eat my sheet. So that is patience, you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like Buddha himself, he's an example, you know. There cannot be a practitioner bigger than Buddha. But most of the time he was living in the society with people. Every day he was walking more than 20 kilometers or something like that, visiting all the villages, talking and mobilizing the things like that. His holiness also did pretty much of that, traveling to all the countries, things like that. So those of us who want to help other people also do a little bit similar type, become more active. Yeah. When you start to explore better Buddhism, mm -hmm. after a while, I find myself asking the question, do I have a faith? And I now feel like that question is supposed to be a barrier, hindrance, because I don't think I have a faith. I just wonder what your advice is to Westerners who think there's a lot in better Buddhism, but then they start to doubt their own faith. Whether it is in the case of taking refuge or it is in the case of developing faith, it takes time. Okay. It takes time. It, it is in terms of development of compassion and Buddhism. It takes a long time, even further, you know, long time. So therefore, first you need to understand the meaning of faith. There are different types of faith. One is one kind of faith is called uh, let's say. Um, One, one kind of faith is called 
clarifying faith or clear faith. Clarifying faith means the example that is there in the text is the clarifying faith is like a last full person, last full person seeing a beautiful, attractive woman. When the, the last full person sees a beautiful, attractive woman, they are night he thinks about it. That's faith, pure faith, clarifying faith. Then there's a second type of faith, which is called trusting faith. Trusting faith, the example of trusting faith is like a small baby is trust to her, to her or his mother. This innocent little baby has so much trust to the mother. This little baby almost feels that my mother can do anything. This little baby puts all her trust in the mother. Another man, of course, is not enlightened. She is not able to do everything, but because of this trust, the mother is able to you know, take very good care of that child. One example. The third is called aspiring faith. Aspiring faith is like a thirsty person looking for water. When that person who is thirsty looking for water, all he thinks about is water. From where I am going to get this water, you see. Now in science they say, if I put two glasses of water here, the one person sitting there who is thirsty, one who is not thirsty, when the one who is thirsty, before he gets this glass of water, he already feels that glass is nearer to him, you see. So that much longing is there. There's one way. This in general. Then the more important thing is there are two types of cultivation of faith. The faith cultivated by people with sharp intelligence and faith cultivated by people who have blunt intelligence. People who have blunt intelligence, whose mind is not very sharp, they do not blind faith. They don't ask questions. They say, yes, 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 yes. This blind faith, more or less, which is in the long run now. So the one that is recommended is the faith developed by intelligence person. The intelligent person asks his questions, studies the text. He, he, he doesn't immediately say, I have faith. So that's what you should be doing. You know, study more, you know, reflect more, contemplate more. And then through that, if you see the usefulness of the teaching and things like that, then naturally you will, your mind will be closer to that teaching. You feel like following it. That's more or less faith. Unshakable faith, of course, it will take some time, but you have faith. So you can say you have faith. But then unshakable faith, unless you train very rigorously, it is difficult. You might give up your faith when there is risk to your life or danger to your life, things like that. And it is not easy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What is your opinion on the, that the, the westernization of the, some ideas of the Buddhist Buddhism, like a mindfulness movement, or meditation app, and etc.? You see. What we are ordinarily doing, the so-called westernization or whatever you're doing is primarily aimed for this life, for making money or whatever. So it's okay. If it is benefiting people, it's okay. But the problem is it will not solve your major problem. It will help you a little bit. If you really go, you want to uproot the problem, and solve the problem, not only this life, but for many lives to come, then there's not the way. Then you should be very faithful to the teaching. Okay? But then westernization makes sense because not everybody is a Buddhist. Like His Holiness says, you take good things from Buddhism and use it. His Holiness himself said, you know, when uh, uh, I forgot this one, what is there? Emotional intelligence. Have you read this book, Emotional Intelligence? Mm -hmm. Daniel Goldman. Uh, Daniel Goldman. Daniel Goldman is my friend also. Mm -hmm. When he wrote this book, he always said, you take from Buddhism and make it reachable to everybody. No need to use the word 
that this is from the things like that. So long as beneficial. So his holiness is not trying to monopolize and make money. He's not saying copyright head, don't touch it. His aim is to benefit others. If it is benefiting like the emotional intelligence, the two, three books, the triple focus, and all those that Daniel Coleman has written is benefiting so many people. Oh, that is a good. That is a good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to the question you brought up before about uh, compassion and wisdom. Yeah. Um, I understand that wisdom is sort of the antidote for against people taking advantage of you. Yeah. Uh, could you expand on the wisdom itself? The wisdom, the wisdom, you know, in Buddhism, we, we talk about the three trainings or three precepts training in morality. Training in one pointed concentration and training in wisdom. This is almost like the heart of the Buddha's teaching, three trainings. In all the Buddhist practices, the foundation is morality, ethical discipline. Morality is morality has no connotation of a discipline that you need to observe because it has been forced upon you by somebody, a Buddha or whoever. There's no connotation at all. Buddhist morality basically means you do these things for your own benefit, for your own well-being. So there are the moralities of three types. Number one, um, restraining the negative deeds. That's morality. And okay. cultivating the positive deeds, that is morality. And then finally, the end purpose is helping everybody. So these three are termed as the moral practices. Okay? Now when you do such a practice, where you don't harm, where you help everybody, where you do the good things, then your mind becomes cool. Because you live your life in such a way, you have nothing to regret, nothing to hide. You're not practicing any duplicity in your life, right? You have nothing to hide. That means your mind is peaceful, your mind is calm. It's only when your mind is peaceful and calm, you can meditate. When you're able to concentrate, meaning you're able to bring together all the energies of your mind, then you can also analyze. Your analytical meditation will also be stronger. So concentration and wisdom help each other. I'll give you an example. My teacher, who is no more now, but my teacher gave me a beautiful example for these three trainings. He said, if you are to cut a tree, if you are to cut a tree, okay, then number one, your overall physical health should be good. That's morality. Now, even if your overall physical health is good, but the arm by which you are picking up the eggs, if that arm is diseased and uh, keen and weak, you can't use that eggs. So without concentration, you know, if your arm is weak, then you will hit up, hit down. You, know, you will be not you will not be able to hit at the same spot again and again. That's what most people do when it takes a long time to cut that small piece of wood or tree. Then the one which actually cuts the tree is not the the body of the person in general, not the arm, but the axe. So the axe which actually cuts the tree must be sharp. If you use a blunt axe, you hit as many times as possible. Your body may be healthy, your arms may be very strong, but you use as much as possible. It's almost like using a hammer to cut the tree. You know? You'll not be able to cut the tree. So the axe, which actually cuts the tree, should be very sharp. So wisdom is like that. So you have morality, where clarity and peace of mind. Then concentrate. And then use the wisdom, which will cut the ignorance. Now here, this is important. 
wisdom understanding emptiness or wisdom understanding reality when we talk about wisdom we are talking about wisdom that discerns discerns the way things are sees the reality as it is okay now when we talk about ignorance is the root cause of all problem ignorance is misconception of reality is to our opposite ignorance when we say ignorance ignorance means we tend to see everything as having inherent independent existence permanent inherent independent existing by itself that's how we think that's misconception this is misconception because if you see carefully then you will know that things are impermanent things exist by depending on many factors they are not independent so it is the wisdom which is able to see the way things are so that is how the misconception of reality is destroyed by this wisdom which which sees the things as they are okay okay yeah so the existence of cultures in Buddhism about what is like morality is what is moral and what is different approaches yeah but you're if you said like morality as person good and helping the youth, like is there a question of what is good and what is helping us? Oh, okay, okay, good. Okay. That, that's many people say there's nothing good and bad thing in me. So <laughs> some Western thinkers also say. <laughs> but you see, then we can always ask questions, but generally speaking, healing is bad. Okay, saving life of people is good. So those activities which directly, indirectly harm others, create misery and suffering on others, is done as bad. Those activities which directly, indirectly help others, sustain others, they are done as good. Okay. For example, if you have an, we don't have to just get stuck with the Buddhist teaching, but if you read the UN Charter, human rights and things like that, there are many do's and don'ts. This is not good, don't do. This is good, you do. That is also there, you see. So that means that we call that universal. Similarly, each and every government, there are also rules and regulations. You can't do this, you can do this, things like that. There is nothing to do with religion, you know. It's really more or less, whether you accept it or not, that is really like more or less simple ethics. It's there actually. But sometimes people say, oh, you can't have secular ethics, you know. If you're in this country, you can't have secular ethics. But they have no status. And there are others who say, oh, you can't, you know, teach ethics without religion. All ethics must come from particular religion. That's what they say. But I don't agree with that. And he sold this, of course, not agree with that. That's why he wrote this book, Beyond Religion. If you're interested, read that beautiful book, Beyond Religion, which talks about this secular ethics, Beyond Religion. That means there is a way of, good way of life, which we should, we all should live, whether you're a believer, non-believer, or even if you're against religion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What is the process of taking refuge? Process of getting refuge is number one, you study. Don't just go to any person and say, give me refuge. No. Just study about the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the meaning of refuge. It is there in all the Lamdam texts. Okay. Read there. Then you should think about who is Buddha, who is Dharma, who is Sangha, how reliable they seem to be, things like that. And then gradually you really get inspired and think, oh, this is the right direction I should do. Then you request somebody to, you know, witness that ceremony. It is making, basically it's really not so much ceremony. You know, if you decide, that's it. But sometimes there is a you know, process of, you know, people doing it in front of a llama or somebody because they feel more comfortable when they say, oh, no, such and such day I took refuge, you know. Which they remember this, you know, occasion, so they feel comfortable. So you can do it. But before you do that, it's not like baptizing, no. Okay. So so before you do that, you should study. 
and understand why why you should take refuge. Okay. You who somebody here? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I talked before about getting to know yourself. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I get this right, but um, by meditation, you examine your thoughts and then you can get to know yourself better. Yeah, I mean, knowing yourself is in a way knowing, similar like knowing many other types of phenomena. Number one, when you know, know about yourself means that you are impermanent. And then second, you don't have independent inherent existence. That means you are uh, uh, aggregate of many phenomena coming together. Your physical form, your feelings, your discrimination, your omission, your consciousness, all this come together. And just this like aggregates coming together also doesn't make a sense. It doesn't make you a human being. Somebody has to give a designation saying that you are a human being. You are a person with such and such name. You know, when all this comes together, then you say, this is me, you know. But from there, there is nothing. And this is important because normally we think there is a concrete person, you know. When you search, it's all like illusion. With that understanding, <laughs> it's, it, it's in the beginning, maybe when you when you don't have proper understanding, it may be frightening, you know, because you are so used with this obsession, you know, I'm here, concrete, talking, you know, I'm making love, you know, making friends, things like that. If it is not there, then there's no charm to live in the society, you know. It's really like that. That's why the, the other day, I don't know whether you were there or not, other day I mentioned this, you know. You can have you can have love without attachment. You can have love without attachment. Normally, when we talk about removing the attachment, it was oh, without attachment, how can I love my girlfriend? You know, without when you talk about impermanent, that person is impermanent, and fragile. Then how can I have love to that person? It's impermanent, fragile. You know? Because you are so used with seeing that person as a concrete. 100% beautiful. <laughs> now suddenly, you know, when you say things are not like that, you get jolted, you see. But then you, if you look carefully, everything is like a dream. And everything functions in the dream. Like, for example, tonight, if you go to bed, you might get a nightmare. Or you might get a very good dream. You are dreaming. You are, you are more or less dead, you know. You are snoring and sleeping, dreaming, nobody knows what is happening. But you are having this nightmare and you know, there's so much fear, you are even perspiring, you know. You, you get that effect as if you are actually dealing with such situations. It's just dream. You see? Similarly, if you get another good dream or good dream, you enjoy, you are really happy. You are sometimes so happy that people while well, dreaming, they laugh, ah, nah, nah, you know, get their way up, you know. So powerful. So when we say things are like illusion, things are like dream, we are not saying they are not there. They are there, but through designation. That's very profound, not easy to understand. Is it like zero? Mathematical figure, zero. People think zero means nothing. But zero is foundation of all mathematical calculations. Similarly, because of this concept of emptiness, everything is possible. So emptiness means empty of independent existence, which means things exist independently. They have what things function. Things can happen, you see, like the function of zero. But it's not easy to be the need to. Think more rigorously and carefully, yeah. Okay. Yeah, about that Lama, um, he was in jail for 15 years and 15 17 years, years. yeah. Uh, if he compassion for that person, yeah. How we can be compassion and love uh, to someone made better to us? What we have to see, what we have to realize in feel compassion to someone made bad to us. Yeah, yeah. How we can how we can yeah, yeah, because because what we have to yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Good question. Not easy. Not easy. Good question. Good question. Because normally it's easier for us for us to develop compassion to somebody we love. There is actually no compassion. 
it's easier because you have attachment to this person. You are mixing the two attachment and compassion. So it's easier to your girlfriend or boyfriend or somebody you really like, you know, you think, oh, I care so much, I care in so much. Because you're obsessed. Right? And when you're obsessed with attachment, you're becoming a little bit blind. Okay, now what we are saying is you give this unconditional love to that person, including the person who is mistreating you, only with the reason that he is like me, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Just as I develop compassion to myself, not necessarily because I'm a perfectly good person. But because you want happiness, do not want suffering, that, that's why you take care of yourself. So similarly, this person, this is very negative right now, but actually he wants happiness, mm -hmm. don't want suffering. But out of ignorance, he's doing all these bad things, which will actually bring more problem on him. You see? So there is a story of many Chinese, you know, prison, uh, caretakers and others who mistreated everything and then later on many of them like uh, had a lot of unhappiness and relief. There's a lot of stories like that. So they suffer. Not even in this world people will suffer. You see, in America, everywhere, people who go to war, kill so many people, they go back. You see, they're all mentally disturbed. Then you have to give all these different kind of therapy, including dog therapy. You, know? you see. Because human, human, actually, human mind is not too much for violence. It's against violence. But we are compelled to do these things because of different situations. But we don't like, so later on we regret, we feel uncomfortable. Okay, one last question, then we are done. Yeah. Uh, I'll start my question uh, by telling that I'm not one to compare between a religious and uh, religious. Mm -hmm. uh, but many cultures and many religions have a treat for a makeup for a sinner. Like if you did a crime or do a bad stuff, you can make up for a sin. Let's say uh, in Islam, we have Ramadan, uh, Ashura, many holidays, uh, not holidays, like many special events that the individual makes up for him, all of his sins. Is there a similar, like, Process in the Buddhist uh, religion? I did not understand. Make up what? A sin, a, a crime. Killing. Yes, if somebody engages in killing, then. Torment for crime. No? Torment for crime. I think purifying your karma. Purifying your wrongdoing. Is there a Buddhist. Yeah, 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 yeah. In Buddhism, we say not only killing, any bad thing that you do. If you want to purify it, the first thing is that you confess it. You accept it that this was wrong. Okay? That's the first step. Then second step, then you develop more compassion to other people or respect to other people, live harmoniously with other people, then make offerings to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, you know, purify your other negative emotions. There are so many things. Yeah. Can you just repeat on the three types of morality? Uh, First is yeah. morality of refraining from negative deeds. Second is cultivating positive deeds. Third is helping sentient beings. Okay. Thank you. So let us recite this prayer together. Oh, it's not prayer, sorry, the dedication. Dedication prayer. Dedication prayer. Okay. May all beings everywhere repeat together. May all beings everywhere, like by sufferings of body and mind, ocean and ocean of happiness and joy. By working on my mind, we know living creatures, some who make evil, 
longing, then no one will help you or be needed. With the mind made long by the British, may the mind see forms and the deaf hear things. May those whose bodies are one with toil be in strong with finding the force. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find May the thirsty find water and diligent fingers. May the whole find well, those big hills so find joy. May the whole world find all, constant and necessary. May there be timely means and bonded to others. May all medicines and hosts they are seen at me. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from heaven. When whatever diseases they are unknown, may they never be free. May the frightened cease to be ever, and those bound be free. May the humblest find power, and may people think of the good of each other. As long as space remains, or as long as it is, until then may I to remain. To dispel is the use of the world. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.